were discussing earlier uh, before service, before we started our music about, you know, uh, Brenda was talking about Christians who are, you know, always saying the devil's after me or the devil's doing this or doing that. And I think a lot of times, too, that is a, an excuse to cover their rebellion against God. Many times the things that are going wrong in our life, you know, we, that's where discernment comes in. You have to be able to discern, is it, is it really the devil after me or the devil doing something to me, or is it my running, my rebellion against what God is telling me to do? And, and we, it, I, I've seen this in pastors. It's, it's just terrible because it, it's so hypocritical because if something's going wrong in their people, they'll, they'll tell them, well, you know, the devil's, it, or, or, or they'll say it's because of your rebellion against God. But if something's happened to me as a pastor, it's because the devil's after me. You know, it's always that hypocritical type of thing. And so we always have to, we always have to discern because many people don't want God to come in and change their life. You know, it's hard when we live in a comfort zone, when we've become comfortable with something. And sometimes Kathy and I, we, we discuss things and you wonder how some people can get comfortable in some of the things that they're in. You know what I mean? Like an abusive relationship. How could that be something you would want to hang on to? You know, if you were married to a, an abusive husband, which is usually the husband, sometimes it can be the wife, you know, why is it that, and then when you do get free from it, you turn right around and marry somebody the same way? Because that's where your comfort zone. Now, see, to her and me, that's not comfortable. I think that's nuts and kooky. But for some people, that's where they're at. And it's hard for people to let go a lot of times when God is speaking to us. It's hard for us to let go of certain things because we grew up with it and we control people with it. We can control our life and control other people with it. You know what I mean? And that becomes very difficult to let go because it's a form of control. And, uh, you know, as far as circumstances changing, you know, I, I've heard this from a lot of different people. Well, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. You know, when we quote the word or we confess the letter over our circumstances, I got news for you. You could quote Freud over your circumstances and some of them are going to change <laughs> because circumstances are not eternal. Circumstances are temporal. The Bible says the things that are seen are temporal. You know, some people have changed their circumstances without confessing anything. They just made a decision and changed their life. Right. Did you know that? Yep. That's why this is not about changing circumstances. This is about Good. changing people. Because you can change your circumstances with your own power and your own... You could move out of this country, you could go get a... You could decide and make a decision, I am going to change my life. You can read... There's plenty of stuff on the internet, there'll be stories about people who changed their life. They were going this direction and they said, I decided I had had enough. I'm going this direction. And they moved, they maybe went and got a college education, and they changed their circumstances. And you know what? They didn't quote one letter out of this Bible. <laughs> the circumstances you're facing right now, are, could, uh, some of them in your life, are not the same ones you were facing a year ago. Things change. And so we, we deceive ourselves into thinking that when we're quoting the letter over our circumstances, we'll see it worked. It, that's, how, that's how this thing works. That's because your circumstances will change anyway. And we, so we think that's the right way to do it, but that's not the right way to do it. Jesus came, God came, Jesus came, the Word came to change you and I on the inside so that in circumstances, see, you just read the Scripture, what was that in Proverbs about uh, those, I can't even remember now, something about, yeah, avoid evil. All right, see, we immediately, what, when you worship and fear God, you avoid evil. That's basically what... You can avoid evil through surrendered worship. Through surrendered worship and what? And the, and the fear of God. All right, see, immediately our mind thinks evil is circumstances. Yes. That's what we think evil is. That's not evil. Circumstances are not evil. It's how you react to the circumstances. That's what is evil. <laughs> so if you want to avoid evil... then somehow something has to get in us to change us how we react to circumstance because that's where the evil is. See, how we react is going gonna, is gonna, to... Uh, look, how we react is going to determine who gets into your life. When that circumstances come to you, 
Those circumstances, and that's those circumstances, how you react is going to determine who you open the door to. Selah. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'm pausing for effect. Well, I don't have anything more to say. I'm just saying that's, that's what determines. You know, we're always talking about, well, I have an open door. Well, then evidently, I have an open door. They'll say, well, I must have a door open to the enemy. Well, then if you really believe that, like I say, some people just say that to say it. But if you really believe that, then somewhere a circumstance is in your life that you're handling incorrectly, and that's opening the door. Because if you handle the circumstance correctly, it shuts the door to the devil. It opens the door to God. And by opening the door to God, you avoid what? What do you avoid? Evil. evil. See, every time you read evil or anything, we're always thinking our circumstances. I know that this is the body of Christ. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's still somewhat in us. And it's uh, the circumstances, they come and they go. They come and they go. Because we live in a seen world. And in a seen world, everything is always changing. See, we're supposed to become an unchange. When I say unchangeable, I'm, I, we're supposed to change into God's image. You know what I mean? So we're supposed to change that way. But we're supposed to actually, the, per, the perfection that we're going to is an unchangeable person. Because the Word, because the word doesn't change. Is Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? If we're supposed to be His body, then what are we supposed to be? The same yesterday, today, and forever. You see what I'm saying? And so when people, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I tell Kathy this all the time, you know, when we're like this, <laughs> that's not unchangeable. <laughs> that's changing all the time. We're supposed to be unch unchangeable, un un unaffected by circumstances. What? Can I read the rest of that? I just read the first part of that. Yeah, there. go right ahead, please. It kind of goes along with what you're saying. It says, you can avoid evil through surrendered worship and the fear of God, for the power of his faithful love removes sin's guilt and grip over you. So it takes it... Takes it so it doesn't affect us anymore. Right. It's, it's not changing our circumstance. It's changing, changing how it us, affects us. How it affects us. Yeah, where, what is that? He wants to know where that is. Proverbs 16.6. 16.6. Okay, with that. <laughs> you ready to go again? John chapter, get out the what? What's the scaffold? What's that? Oh, scalpel. Oh, okay. I thought you said scaffold. <laughs> then I can hear, can't I? <clears throat> I think I'll start in John, in John chapter 6. I don't know where to start here. I'm trying to figure out. Well, I could go. I could probably start in verse 1, <laughs> but I better not. No, I can't either start in verse 1. I think I'll start in uh, verse 28. It says, Then they asked him, and I'm going to be in the NIV. It says, Then they asked him, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Now, when we read, believe in the one he has sent, what does that mean to you? Okay. 
You'd say that on the, the deal. I want to get some opinions here of what that means. I believe when he says to do something, it's going to work if I do it. Okay. That's, that's good. Yeah. Anybody else? Joseph. Oh, wait a minute. You've got to get on the mic here. <laughs> it says here, he has sent that you cleave to, trust, rely on, and have faith in, in his messenger. Okay. Now, what does that mean to you, though, personally? What it means to me personally yeah. means that, you know, I need to pay attention to his voice, what he's saying to me. Yeah, that's good. That's what I was looking for. About In other words, when it says, believe in him, the one he has sent, what was, what was really being sent? Jesus. I know, but what was really being sent into the earth? The voice, thank you, James, the voice of God was being sent. See, we always want to believe in a man. And that's okay, because he was a man. But that's where we get stuck at, and that's where a lot of the church gets stuck at, is they're wanting to believe, they want to believe in the man, Christ Jesus. Not the voice that came with it. He was the Word. He was the spoken Word of God. See, that's what, so when it says, believe Him and who He sent, it's we believe in, in the man, Christ Jesus, but we believe in the voice that came from that man. You see what I mean? And we get stuck, because everybody, because you go to anybody in the church and, that, and ask them if they believe in Jesus, what are they going to tell you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yes, but do you believe in the voice that Jesus has sent into the earth? And now that we're the body of Christ, where is that voice coming from now? Us. Us? You, now, ask them if they believe that. Yeah. Yeah, and see where they go with that. See, so everybody says they believe in Him, or all the church people will say, yeah, we believe in Jesus, but do they really believe in the one who was sent, which was the voice of who God was? <clears throat> what? Did you say, oh, okay, all right. <clears throat> believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then? See, here, here we go. Get, they got, get stuck right off the bat. What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? See, they wanted to see something. They didn't want to hear something. They wanted to see something. <clears throat> what will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So you see the context of this? Because what was the true bread from heaven? His voice, right? So when we go back up here and you say, believe in the one who he has sent, notice where, where Jesus' context is. It's the words that he's speaking. It's not just a man. He was a man. Yeah, I'm not taking that away from it. But when he says, believe in him who has sent, you've got to carry the voice with the man. And if you don't do that, it's going to foul you up. And tell me, has it? Yes. What? She's got her hand up, like. <clears throat> no, because I think I think he he said that to the devil, okay. didn't he? On the, on the temptation, yeah. <clears throat> when you were talking about that, he's that the living on? bread. Okay. okay. He's the living bread that came down from heaven. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he was the word proceeding out of the mouth of God. Right. And he said, I am the true bread. So in other words, what he was saying, you don't live by physical bread alone, mm -hmm. but by every word that's coming out of the mouth of God. That is the real bread, and that's who I am. Right. I'm the voice, the, the voice, the word of God. Yeah. There's something that we need to recognize whenever you read your Bible, or listen, anytime you, you uh, um, are listening to a message like in another church or anything, and you read a scripture about believing in Jesus, or, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, anytime his name is mentioned, always keep in mind that his context was the voice that was coming out of the man. It'll change a lot of scriptures the way you see them. 
Because we have, in the church today, we have, what we've done is we have believed in the man, the historical man Christ Jesus. And so when we read a scripture like that, people will read right over that and think, they'll think, yeah, that's talking about me, I believe in Jesus. But it was believing in the voice that was coming forth from the man. Always keep that in mind whenever you hear anybody or you come across the scripture in the, in the Bible. Or, I, you know, I can't think of any right now, but where Paul is talking about believing or having faith or you know, believing in Jesus, always remember their context was always the voice that was coming out of him. In other words, the now word. Well, Jesus is now in heaven, right? And so like I said, where does the voice, I want to hit this, where does the voice come from now? It comes from his body because we're his body. But you know what? He's still the head, isn't he? So it's got to be his word, not my own, not your own, or not your own. It has to be his word that's coming forth from you. Okay, he said to them, very, uh, well, I want to read that again. Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. What gives life to the world? His voice, right? His, his now, what he is speaking right now in this moment, this present moment, is what gives life to the world. Sir, they said, Always give us this bread. <laughs> Do you think, Je- you know what? Yeah, yeah, Jesus, you know what? Jesus is going to take them up on it. Yeah. They just asked, didn't they? Yeah. See, how many times do we ask, <laughs> give us this bread always? And we're going to find out what happens here shortly. What happens when Jesus answers? I mean, was that a correct thing to ask? Yes. Absolutely. It, the, the, to give the, the, and when somebody says, you know, this will give life to the world, and we'll always give life to the world, wouldn't you, always, wouldn't you naturally say, give us this bread always? It's a desire in our heart, correct? But how many times do people make that prayer, and Jesus says, okay, or God says, okay, I'll give you this bread, and immediately they're gone? Because we're going to find out a bunch of them left. He gave them what they asked for, and they left and walked with him no more. (laughs) Sir, they said, give us, always give us this bread. Now, that's a good good statement to make, always. Not sometimes, always. That's what what really the true disciples of God, or the true disciples of Jesus, should really be asking. Give us this bread Always. Always. Then Jesus declared, here here we go. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, I think we've had teaching on that. You, you, You realize that doesn't mean natural food and natural drink, right? It means that you won't hunger and thirst after the things of the world. In other words, circumstances will not have an effect on you. You know what I mean by that? See, when, when you're in a bad circumstance, aren't you hungry and thirsty to get out of it? What does hunger represent? A what? Desperation? A craving? Can we say a craving? You can't get what well, that's a good one. What was that? You can't get your mind off of it, right? If you're hungry. He said, those who come to me will be won't be thirsty and won't be hungry. In other words, your in other words, your circumstance is not going to drive. You know, I quoted that I quoted or paraphrased that scripture last week. I said Paul, he said he was content whether he was what? Abased or abounding. You know what? He wasn't hungry and thirsty. Yeah, you're going to doesn't mean you're not going to hunger and thirst for God. It means that the, that the things of the world that cause you to be hunger and thirsting, to get away from these certain things or to change things in your life, you won't be hungry and thirsty for anymore. I think that's a great promise. Because so much of the world is driven by hunger and thirst. And sometimes so are we. <laughs> but as I've told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, 
but to do the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those He has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him... All right, now believes in what? When it says believes in Him, what are we talking about? See, there's another scripture. Believes in Him. In other words, they're believing in the man who is now speaking what's coming from heaven. Not just the man Christ. He's not even that He's just the Son of God. It's the voice. Yeah, he, well, yeah, He says, I only say what the Father says. I only do what the Father does. But So whenever it talks about believing in Jesus, I want it, you guys to get this down to where you don't forget it. This has got to become your flesh. This has got to become the man of the day. That whenever you read this about believing in Jesus, not just believing in a Savior, because today's Resurrection Sunday, right? What are most people believing about Jesus? That He came up out of the... What's being preached mostly this morning, probably? How to go to heaven. You know, believe in the historical man Christ Jesus. Sorry about that. The man Christ Jesus. Believe in the historical man Christ Jesus. He was buried. He was resurrected. And now if we believe that he did that and, and we confess our sins, right, and we say we're sinners and ask his forgiveness, we get to go to heaven. There's zero, probably in most churches, there's going to be zero about the voice that came from him that is still speaking today. And yet that's what the whole resurrection is about. The whole resurrection is about the voice, and we've sidestepped it with, with a bunch of flesh issues. Well, there's lots of reasons. That's probably a big one, but... <laughs> yeah, that's another one. Well, I think a lot of it... You know, we have, to, we have to give benefit of the doubt. A lot of it is ignorance is we just don't know. We, we haven't been taught correctly in the church that this is about the voice of God. It's all over in the Scripture. I mean, you read the book of Hebrews, and it's, you know, the race of faith. They all heard what God was saying at the time. You know, I've used this before. I said, Noah didn't read about himself and decide to go build an ark. Noah didn't read about himself. Hey, I'm going to lead the children out of Israel, you know, because it says right here that that's what I'm going to do. They all heard God speak what they were supposed to do. And that is so important, and the church has to get this. The paradigm shift, there has to be a paradigm shift because most of the church is still operating in a letter. I know they are. And that's why we're failing. We're not becoming the people we're supposed to become, and we never will if we stay in the letter. It has to become the voice. We love the letter. I want to say that, right? We love the letter because why? Why do we love the letter? Because we can hear him through it. He'll speak, these things will come alive to us, right? i got to repeat all of this, because if somebody tunes in, what, are you telling me you don't like the Bible? Are you going to get rid of the Bible? No, we don't want to get rid of the Bible. Well, yeah, we read it with hunger, because we're cert we want God to speak to us through it. Anybody, have you ever repeat anything you've ever said? Have you ever repeated anything you've ever said? Huh? <laughs> See, so if when we're reading this, yeah, when we're reading this Bible, can God say the same thing again? Yes. Yeah, don't you repeat yourself? Yes. <laughs> what? That's a good, that's a good, that's, uh, there you go. Why, what did you just say? She said she has to. Why? That's right, because you've repeated yourself to people, right? right? Why? Because they what? They didn't get it the first time. So that's why we read our Bibles. Okay, I don't want to harp on that a long time. but uh, Let's see. <clears throat> Last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Now, see, this is, this is typical. You ask for the bread always, and as soon as you start to get it, people start to grumble. Yeah, I, did, I know. I, I read this stuff, and I, I, just, I want to pull my hair out. I, I don't know. I just, I, cause I'm, but I'm reading it from the standpoint of, of knowing what's going on, and, and they probably didn't. I don't know. But 
They ask for the bread always, Jesus starts to give it to them, and immediately they begin to grumble. And that's what I found in the ministry that I have, is that people come in and they want God, they're asking for God, they're praying for God, they're praying for the bread of heaven, they're praying, God speak to me, God speak to me, and I know Kathy's done this many times individually, I do it corporately as ministry, and I've done some individually, and what happens? (laughs) That look was worth a thousand (laughs) dollars. <laughs> Immediately, people start to grumble. What? <clears throat> well, it makes it sound like when they said, sir, they said, always give us his bread. Remember, now he's talking to Jews, okay? So they're wanting the bread from heaven. They're asking for it. But many times, most of the time when people get it, they begin to grumble. Because it's not the bread they thought it was going to be. (laughs) No. It comes in a different way. It sounds good because who who doesn't want everlasting life? You see, everybody wants, well, everybody wants everlasting life. It depends on how you get to it. That's what they don't like. Okay, and where was I? Let's see. Yeah, my father, this is everyone who looks. What? I'm ready for 42. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm going to read that again. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them. And I will raise them up at the last day. What's he talking about when he's talking about raising you up at the last day? What do you think that means? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, we can look at it as an ongoing thing, right? But we but what would be if we were going to look at it etern- in the future, what would it mean? Yeah. Resurrection. Now, what does resurrection mean? Huh? Yeah, it's recovery of everything that was lost. So we can look at it and I know we we can look at you know you can always look at things for for past, present, and future. So we can look at it as present. Of course, we can look at it as past of things we've been set free from, and that was our last day. We can look at it as present of things God is dealing with us now that will be our last day in the future. But then we can also look at it when the church reaches perfection, and that's the last day. Won't we be happy? Or will we grumble? (laughs) It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from Him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. Okay, now, here we go again. Believes what? Huh? What word? What word? The spoken word. Not just the, because again, you'll have people, well, I believe in the word, but do you believe in the spoken word? In other words, the word that is coming forth on a day by day basis. Are you hungering and thirsting after it and listening to it and obeying it? That's where the eternal life comes from. There's, huh? Yeah, your daily bread. There's a whole lot of people that carry a Bible into church this morning that are listening to a resurrection message that think they have eternal life, and they don't. They, ha- they don't. We haven't got it yet. I am the bread of heaven. Your, now listen to this. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness... And yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. Now, what do you think he's talking about there? I've shared on this before, by the way. Huh? Yeah, he's preaching immortality right here. 
Because notice what it said. It said, your fathers ate the manna and they all died. If this was talking about... Um, uh, what? If this was talking a spiritual thing, heaven and hell, that must mean that Moses, Joshua, and Caleb are in hell. Because it says they died. If this is talking spiritual, it says they all ate the manna, it says they all died. You see what I mean? What, did they, what death did they all die? The physical death, right? Do you think Moses, Joshua, and Caleb went to hell? No. no. So this isn't talking about spiritual. Jesus is speaking eternal life. He's speaking immortality right here. And he says those... Uh, he said, but here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat. How many people can eat of it? Um, that means college educated, right? People have been to seminary, right? People who read commentaries, right? Uh, people who uh, have never had any of that, correct? It says, anyone may eat of this and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. First they grumble, then they argue. Isn't that the, isn't that the way? First they grumble. You can see it. Then they're going to argue. <laughs> see? What is grumbling? Mur what is murmuring? What... Give me, huh? Yeah, but isn't murmuring and grumbling kind of under your breath and kind of, you know, you, you, know, you can grumble and murmur in your head. Yeah, and you usually do. But notice what it says. Now they began to argue sharply. When it gets to arguing sharply, now it starts to come out, out of your mouth. Yeah, angry outbursts, that's what your says. Yeah. <clears throat> How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Again, what is He saying here? What, huh? What's He saying? Eat my flesh, drink my blood. The voice. Because what was His flesh and His blood? What's in the flesh and the blood? Whose life did He have in Him? And God is speaking God, isn't he? Yeah. See, it, it all always goes back. I, I know most of us probably know this about the voice, but we really need to know it's the voice <laughs> and stay away from anything else. You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. What? Yeah, she says, can you imagine what they're thinking? Look, they don't, they, his disciples didn't even walk away from him yet. Even when he says this, they don't understand it, but that's not when they walked away. <clears throat> Who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living, living, who? The living Father? Why do you think he called him a living Father? Thank you, because he's speaking. You're getting it. He's speaking. He's a living Father. He's speaking. He's always speaking. You know, like I told you before, you know, we've been told so many times that, well, God doesn't speak anymore because we have the Bible. Well, sorry, you just killed God. You just killed any chance for eternal life. <clears throat> just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors, here, here he makes a statement again, your ancestors ain't man and died. But whoever feeds on this bread will live, how long? Forever. Forever. Well, that means go to heaven. No, because we just read that it said all of those who ate the manna did what? So, so then you must not believe any of them went to heaven. If this is talking about heaven and this is a spiritual statement, you see what I'm saying? Then you cannot believe that Moses and Joshua and Caleb went to heaven. They must have gone to hell because it says they all died. 
You understand what I'm saying? I hope the people on the internet. In other words, if this is spiritually, then they all died spiritually. Because we can't change the context. We can't, say, we can't switch from natural to spiritual in the same thought process. So when he says we'll live forever, he's preaching immortality right there. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. And I want to make this uh, very clear. When I talk about immortality, I'm not talking about immortality independent of God. Okay? I'm talking about those who believe in Jesus. If you feed on Jesus, you eat his flesh and drink his blood, what kind of life did he lead? It's total surrender to the Father. The living God. Total surrender. There's no point in his life where we see he made a decision independent of, the, of God his Father. Zero. So this is not going to be a mortal, an immortality where we live and we make decisions independent of God. Because when you do that, all of a sudden, you're not believing in Jesus anymore. You don't have his life flowing through you. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? See, now, they got, they got the hard teaching, but they haven't left him yet. They wait for another statement. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? <laughs> I think I heard somebody say one time, if Jesus asks you a question like that, be aware. <laughs> <clears throat> then what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where He was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. Or the New King James says, the flesh profits nothing. Now they're going to leave. They can handle anything up to that point. As soon as He said that, that's the straw that breaks the camel's back. He said, the flesh counts or profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You know, many people can take hard sayings. Many people can take hard preaching. It's when you tell them the flesh counts for nothing, that's when they decide to leave. That's the, that's the straw that always breaks the camel's back. And notice what he said after he said that the flesh counts for nothing. He says, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled them. What does that mean? Is God picking and choosing people to enable? What's He doing? It's there for everyone. It's out there for everyone, isn't it? All right, see, this is one of the reasons, again, why we have such a hard time in our church is because we, at least we try to put all flesh stuff down. And each one of you has to ask yourself where you're at in this. We just got done with praise and worship, and I see people flagging. You know what I mean? What was, what's that flagging supposed to be pointing to? Okay, it's supposed to be pointing to Jesus, which is what? His voice. In other words, as you're flagging, you're supposed to be thinking, what are you saying, God? What are you saying through this? What are you saying to me? Do you have something to speak to the church? Do you have something to speak out of the atmosphere? Do you have something I'm just... Do you have, do I have, am I supposed to pray something? We don't just flag because it's fun to flag or because we like the colors. We can like the colors because they point to a voice. And don't let the flag become flesh because flesh counts for nothing. In other words, if you go to a church that won't let you flag, well, and I just can't worship, your flag has now become flesh and it will profit you nothing. Nothing. Zero doesn't say it profits just a little. It says nothing. Same with the tambourines. You know, sometimes I like to play the tambourine. 
uh, it, it's fun to tambourine. But I remember one time when we told some people we were going to put it down a list and they could only do it so many, they walked out. Guess what? The tambourine had now become flesh. The tambourine was not pointing to the voice. Your healing that God heals you with, if you take that healing and set it apart from what it points to, it now becomes of no profit to you. We'll say, you say, well, yeah, but I'm healed. I feel better. I don't have pain anymore. So that's profit to me. But what's he talking about here? What's the context of this? What's he trying to lead them into? Life, immortality. Your healing, if you set that apart, if it, in other words, if it does not point you to the voice of God, point you to something greater, and you, let me ask you a question. How many people do you think God healed in here thought, well, man, I'm healed. I'm going to go do, do my thing now. How many people do you think do that? Lots of them do it, right? It, so it will, in other words, they're never going to reach immortality by allowing that thing now to become flesh. Because when we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we're talking about the voice of God. Even the preaching that we do. Sounds good, tickles the ear, great revelation, right? But if it doesn't point to the greater one, to a voice that can speak to you, it becomes flesh. The flesh of the world. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Not his, somebody else's. Human. Many people have. That's why. That's why this isn't about circumstances. Did not. Didn't we just? Didn't you all just agree with me that humans can change their circumstances through human effort? But what did it profit them? We look like it. We, see, we because we live in this realm, and we we think our whole life is centered around this realm. So we think all of these things are profiting us. But are they bringing you to what eternal life is? See, that's what I'm saying. Um. We have instruments. We have tape music. A lot of people have bands, you know, live band music. It, am I saying any of these things are wrong? Would live band be wrong? No. But will it be wrong if it becomes flesh? So if you get a live band and then you go back to some place that's a small church, I mean, Kathy and I had to sing one time where there was five people. There was the pastor, a guest speaker, one of their people, and us too. Five people. Would you be able to sing as demonstratively there as you do here? Yeah, with a, with a little bitty boom box this big, you know, about this long, with two little speakers on the end, and it sounds, you know how we got these big booming speakers, you know, that really blast you? Yeah, these sound real tinny. Have you ever listened to one of those little things? They sound real t Now, could you, could you worship and flag and do all the stuff we do? If not, then what's happened is our music is starting to become flesh. And when that happens, your music won't profit you anything. Oh, it'll be great. It'll sound good. You can jump up and down and do all your stuff, but it's not going to lead you to eternal life. So when he says it profits you nothing, that's when they decided to leave. And that's one of the most difficult things we have as leaders, as ministers, and as people, is the flesh. It, it, that's so hard for us to get out of us. How many ministers come up with ideas to bring people into the church? Yeah, I mean, Easter, yeah, Easter, whatever it is. I mean, with the, is there anything wrong with an Easter breakfast? No. But if our mentality is, is to use it to bring people in, guess what? The flesh will profit us nothing. Because we just read that no one can come to Jesus unless God enables... They, they have to get to the name. And here's the concept. Well, we'll get them in here, and then we'll preach to them, and then maybe that enabling will take place. But here's the problem is, is that whatever you, put, whatever you use to draw them in with, that will be the thing they always have confidence in. I mean, the people that are brought in. And when that, 
method is now done away with, most of your people will probably leave because that's where they put their confidence. See, most of us came to Christ, and most of you are here, why? Why are you here? What were you looking for? What brought you to this place? To know, yeah, what, what happened to you? What, you, you decided you wanted to find a, huh? Yeah, what? That wasn't our live music. It wasn't the money either. So it wasn't that. What was it that, that each of you came to that decided that you had, that you had, to, you had to find some, whatever decision, what were you looking for? More of God than what you had. So do, you think, so do you think if people are satisfied where they're at, they're going to hit this enabling? No. The satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. To the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. So even those that grumble, I think, I think every time God reveals Himself, we're, we're all going to grumble. But that bitter thing will become sweet to those that are really hungry. But to those that aren't, the bitter thing stays better. Yeah, I'll read that here in a minute. That's what. Well, I'll just read it right now. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Do you do not want to leave too? Do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, "Lord, to whom shall we go?" You have the what? Words of life. The words of eternal life. Again, there's another illustration. What words is, is Peter talking about? The spoken voice word of God. Notice he said, you, notice what he didn't say. Uh, Simon Peter answered him, Lord... To whom shall we go? We have the Old Testament we can read. Is that what he said? No. We've got all, we've got the Psalms, we've got the Proverbs, we've got, you know, Isaiah, we have uh, Genesis, and, 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 and yeah, we got Moses, we got all that, we got all this stuff written down, it's right there in the synagogue on the parchments, we have that. What did he say? He said, you have the words of The spoken words of eternity. See, they recognize the difference between letter and spoken word. See, that's why they understood. I mean, that's why he made that statement. See, he understood. He recognized. You recognize it too. You you people can. You. I'm not saying that. (laughs) I'm getting really bad at stuttering sometimes. They knew the difference, and there's another scripture that verifies this, the difference between the letter and the spoken word. Remember when the soldiers went to arrest Jesus? What did they say? Never a man spoke spoke like this. All right, Peter, you know, Peter, James, you know, Peter, these guys knew what was being preached. You know, they, they were Jews. They went to the synagogue. They listened to the letter. But they recognized something different in the voice of Jesus. And he said, where should we go? You have the words of eternal life. This letter over here didn't have it. It's what you're speaking has it. That's why we're always wanting to listen to what somebody, what, when God is speaking. That's what everything we do here, everything, our praise and worship, the words that we get are pointing to one thing. That's the voice of God. Always keep that in mind. When you go to a church service, you attend a church service, remember, we're always wanting whatever it is we're doing, whatever it is they're doing, try to look at it as, what are you saying, God? What are you saying? We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. So what is it that they knew? Is they knew why, would they, why did they know He was the Holy One of God? Because, yeah, be, yeah, yeah, because that's just what He said. The words that you have spoken. See, that's how they knew. Then Jesus replied, I have not 
Have I not chosen you, the twelve, yet one of you is a devil? He meant Judah, the son of Icariot, who was the one of the twelve who had later to betray him. So, um, let's see, uh, I got another scripture. <clears throat> if, we, if we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about the Old Testament children of Israel. And if you recall, I'm going to quote it, try to paraphrase it. It said, the word that they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with that. I think that's where it is. No, oh, I, I thought it was in, in 1 Corinthians. He ta- I know in 1 Corinthians he talks about how they came out of Egypt and, and uh, some of them were destroyed by the destroyer. It may be in Hebrews where it says that. Hmm? It's in Hebrews. That prob- that's probably it then. It said the word that they heard did not profit them. But notice what they had. They had the splitting of the Red Sea. They had a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of fire by day. They had water from a rock. And we've discussed, you know, how could, you, how could a water from a rock give water to so many million people? Uh, they had many different... Mer- their shoes didn't wear out. They left Egypt. How many were sick and afflicted? None. Oh, what, none? Four weeks. Yeah, none. And yet it says, but the word that they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. So notice it was the hearing of the word that was going to profit them. Notice that the writer did not say they were profited because they came out of Egypt, they got to go through the Red Sea, they got the pillar of fire, and they had the pillar of smoke, and their shoes didn't wear out, and there was none feeble among them. What was, what was the writer counting profit as? His voice, eternal life, immortality. Being constantly under the rule and reign of God. That's when, when Jesus talks about profit... When the brighters talk about profit, that's what they're talking about. We always Americanize it. And yeah, it helps your life. I'm not taking anything away from that. If God heals you, that's going to be good, isn't it? You don't want to be in pain, do you? Pain is not a good thing. But take that thing that God blesses you with and let it point it to something greater. Because there's something greater than being free. I know it's hard to believe. There's something greater than being free from pain. I know that's going to be it really be difficult for Kathy to understand that because she, she couldn't conceive of that. But the Bible tells us that there is. So we have to trust that there's something greater. And let that thing point to something greater. As we're flagging, let those flags point to something greater. As we tambourine, let the, or your little bells, that points to something greater. What are you saying, God? Because the flesh will profit you nothing. Anything that becomes flesh profits you nothing. Their miracles became flesh because it didn't profit them. Who wouldn't want to see the Red Sea split? Would you like to see that? I'd like to see that. Who wouldn't want to see a pillar of fire by night and a, and a pillar of cloud by day to have you lead you? Sometimes, I, wouldn't that be kind of easier than trying to hear his voice? If you had actual something you could see to follow? Yeah, writing on the wall. All these different things happen, but it didn't help them, and it didn't profit them. But we would think that it would. Because, yeah, they did, in other words, the word, notice what it says, the word that they heard. In other words, a voice was speaking, right? They never let the sign point to the greater thing. Oh, and they took all the spoils of Egypt. But it didn't profit them. We would think we had profited. If we had a church like that, if, we had, if our church went through that, we'd be in charisma, what is that, charisma magazine. <laughs> we'd have thousands of people here trying to get through the doors if we had all that but it didn't profit them. In other words, what they brought with them that we would think profited them became idolatrous later on. (laughs) 
That's why we have to be careful. Don't let your flags become idolatrous or tambourines or our revelation. Don't let it become idolatrous. It's God, what are you saying today? I think I'll end there. This is a good place to end. I've got another scripture. Maybe I'll continue it two weeks from now. <clears throat> Anybody have anything? I mean, I know you're getting the message, so, but I want to read the other scripture uh, next couple of weeks from now because and continue maybe on this. And, uh, man, the voice is precious, more precious than gold or rubies or silver. It's almost a sin to compare the two. There's such a higher value. Thanks, God, what are you saying today? Or what are you not saying? See, how many times do we operate in something when God isn't saying anything because we think we're, obli we're obliged to? Remember the leader that told us, well, even if you don't know what you're doing, just act like you know what you're doing. Uh, I think there's some flesh in there. Huh? Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. I think that's kind of flesh, don't you? And I don't think that's going to profit anybody. It didn't. Lots of flesh out there. And we have to be learn we, we have to be a people that learn the difference between spirit, spirit and life, and flesh and death. And emotion and desire is not the determin will not discern it. Do you know why? Huh? Because it's flesh and we like it. Really blatant. But I don't think this profited anybody when the minister I was listening to said, you guys that are having trouble with marriage, you need to get some pornography. That's real blatant. That should be real obvious. But you know what? It wasn't to the people that were jumping up and down and clapping. That's flesh. That's going to profit you nothing. Yeah, that's what that's what that's what nonprofit is. <laughs> See? See, when God, yeah, it's destruction. When God talks about profit, what's he talking about? He's talking about what kind of life? Abundant, Abundant life. What other kind of life? Eternal. Eternal life, which means what? Never, Never to die. So it may sound good, it may look good, it may uh, fool with your emotions and everything. And, I'm, and again, I'm going to say this. Sorry, this is a little bit different message. All things were created what? Okay. Yeah, that's right. He, yeah. He gives, he gives us all things richly to enjoy. He created all things what? By Him, for Him, and through Him. Okay? So the next time somebody tells you, drums are of the devil, uh-uh. It was created by Him, for Him, through Him. Well, tongues is of the devil. It was created by Him, for Him, and through Him. See, all of these, you, if you think about it, even a, even a gun created by Him, for him and through him. How can, well, how, how can that be? Because when I target shoot, if, uh, um, when I target shoot and shoot at a target, what is sin? Missing the mark. Why are people constantly trying to improve, think spiritually, trying to improve everything that we own? See, when guns were first, at, I want to use guns because somebody might think of that and think, well, why would... That can't be by him or for him and through him. When guns were first invented, they shot pretty poorly. And man has, has taken and increased the, 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 the betterment of them to where now they shoot real tight groups like this. And there's a good feeling about shooting a real tight group. Tell me, how good is it a feeling when you hit the mark? So, so when I shoot that gun, and, I, and when I got a target at home, 
If you shoot an inch, this is what a standard, an inch at 100 yards. That'd be about that big, I guess, a grouping. She'd shoot three times. I shot at 229 yards one time, and I shot a 5 8 inch group. I hung the target in my garage. Yeah, that, <laughs> wonderful. That's like, I couldn't even see where I was hitting. You know, I mean, I knew I was hitting the target because I already knew that it was fairly sighted in, and, but I couldn't see where, I, where the hole was, and I thought, well, I'll just shoot two more times and then drive up, because I was in a field, I drove up to get the target. So I went ahead and shot two more times, and I drove up, and there's this little tiny group like that. Now, do you know how that made me feel? <laughs> I could take on the devil today. No. <laughs> see? Uh, no, because you see, what happens is, is that when this becomes your flesh, you begin to look at things spirits, the nat in the natural, you know what I mean? You start to look at things, everything that happens around you, everything that's being created, including guns, you begin to look at, how does that relate to this kingdom of God? And I immediately thought, you know, hitting the target, hitting the mark, not missing the mark. Missing the mark is no fun, even in the natural with a gun. If you're off target or it doesn't group well, you want to get rid of the gun. I wish we could do that in the spirit, but we don't. We want to hang on to it and try to fix it. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, hitting the seat, or, or, or well, I don't know what that is, but, yeah, okay, well, that leaves me out, because I can't do that, but uh, th that's what I'm saying, is that enables me, whenever I get a tight shooting gun, I always think of hitting the target, and, you know, giving a message that hits the target. When you give a message that hits the target, it, I'm going to tell you, it feels good. When you give a word, when you pick music out that hits the target, does that feel good? When somebody says, boy, this music just ministered, right? It's funny that you, just like Terry said today, you picked out this music because this is what I'm feeling like. Doesn't that make you feel like, boy, I got a good rifle today? <laughs> Doesn't it? <clears throat> you give a word to somebody and it hits the target? Doesn't that feel good? What, how do you feel if you miss the target? <laughs> Throw that thing away. Yeah, woe is me. So, huh? <laughs> I get rid of it. I don't like them because I don't think you can fix a bad gun. I mean, I guess you can. You can fix some of them. But I bought a couple here in, several years ago that shoot really, really well. And, it's, and I, they're just, every time I shoot a tight group like that, I automatically think hitting the mark in the kingdom of God. Hitting the right message, hitting the, singing the right song, the right praise and worship. You know, if somebody flags, you know, or plays a, an instrument or something, and it hits the mark in somebody's life, how do you feel? See? So everything in the natural, huh? Yeah. How about a nuclear weapon? All things were created by him, for him, and through him. What does a nuclear weapon do? Huh? It's huge, it's bright, huh? loud, it's destructive, yeah, it, yeah. You say, well, how does that, God doesn't, he doesn't do that. Yeah, he does. No, not through a nuclear weapon, but that's a type and a shadow that can point to something that, look, everything was created by him, for him, and through him, so everything that's created, you look at that, and what does it point to? Huh? Destroying the enemy? How about destroying the sin in your life? That's destroying the enemy. He, that's it. See, the flesh profits nothing. That nuclear weapon's not going to bring you to eternal life. But it can point to something, if, if you let it, it can point to something that can. Because all things were created by him, for him, and through him. All instruments, everything. Any questions? Huh? People what? People, yeah. Created by him, for him, and through him. But man gets in there and perverts it, see, and it becomes something deadly. For, it, it, it actually harms eternal life 
immortality. But we can still look at the things created and say, it points to Him. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. Thank You, God, that we're looking for the voice. We're looking for the voice, always looking for the voice. And God, that's what eternal life is. Like Jesus said, even in John again, that they might know You, which is what? A speaking God. A God that speaks. And We love the eternal life. We love that You preach immortality. But we love that we can get to know You. That's what we love. And Father, let all of these things that we do always point to something greater than what we're doing. That's the idea. Is it supposed to point to something as to who you are? And Father, we just thank you and give you praise and glory. Thanks you give understanding to those on the internet. Amen.